The series of papers that uh, Brucey has published on reserve forces really come out of the crisis in Ukraine. Um, it's become very clear to governments across NATO and more widely that we desperately need more defence, we need more capability, we need more mass, and we need to reach into new technologies. But at the same time, there's a great shortage of money. Um, no government's feeling rich at the moment. And so all the major NATO countries and our English-speaking allies are looking at reserve forces as a way of providing more capability at an affordable cost. I think the main point is the reserves are part of what we spend on defence, not as an add-on, but as an essential way in which we defend this country and help our allies abroad. When I joined the Air Force many years ago, there were over 100,000 uniformed airmen. Now it's down below 30,000. At the same time, the size of the commercial and civilian sector in aerospace and aviation has, has increased by a factor of five. That means that the Royal Air Force is increasingly reliant upon the skills, particularly the high-tech skills, of people outside. At the same time, it's more vulnerable to the changes of requirements of the civilian aerospace and aviation community and that can affect recruiting in and indeed retention. One of the ways of solving that problem is to make much better use of reserves, both in the air and on the ground. We need to ensure that there's a much more flexible way of getting people back into the Air Force through the reserves after they've left. And equally, we must ensure that we look at how we use reserves from the outset and not as an add-on to a particular program. Of the five eyes, the United States, New Zealand, Australia and Canada, we have by far the lowest level of reserves in relation to the number in the regular forces. I think of the lessons that we've learned across these papers. Perhaps the most important is that for land forces anyway, reserves need to be the second echelon. They need to be what comes after a large part of the regular force has been killed or, or worn out, rather than what we rather degenerated into in Afghanistan, which is simply using reservists uh, to fill places, mostly in junior ranks in the regular army. I think on the uh, naval side, one of the things that we've found is that once again, just as we did in the 1930s, Britain has neglected her coastal and littoral um, defences. We focused on a blue water navy, it was all about battleships then, it's aircraft carriers and escorts now. Um, but while the Germans, of course, were building up an e-boat force who were able to hammer us around our ports, as we read these reports of uh, Russian um, interdiction and reconnaissance in the North Sea, where we've got vulnerable cables and so on, and as we reflect on the fact that every nuclear power station has a vulnerable uh, outfall into the sea, as we reflect on the fact that 95% of our goods by weight come in by port, and there's no defence plan for most of them. So we begin to see we need to do something about it, but the regular forces can't possibly afford to do it. We need more of a an armed RNLI as a response force. So I think the time is right now for us to be much clearer as to how we need to move forward to make use of skills outside the Air Force, back inside the Air Force, primarily by a better use of reserves. Training of pilots is very expensive. We need to ensure that by using the reserves we have a better return for the taxpayer on the cost of training them in the first place. And secondly, the only way we're going to deal with crises when they occur in terms of capacity and resilience is to be able to call on a much larger cohort of reservists to fill the gaps at home when the crisis is abroad or indeed to follow up the area that is under threat 
as a second echelon to support the regular forces, which undoubtedly by that time will be overstretched. So those are the main reasons, I believe, we need to look again at the way we look at, we, we deal with our reserves in terms of air on the ground and in the air. Taking advantage of the skills outside, particularly in ten, terms of space, in terms of AI and tech generally, but also in terms of giving us a bigger punch when it's needed in an emergency. I think we have to learn from Ukraine. The Ukrainian regular army was relatively small at the beginning of that war, and it's a very impoverished country. But the fact they were able to call on high quality reserves like the Azov Battalion, um, who held Mariupol for so long, um, was crucial. And the fact that they're now thinking so hard about how do you bring specialist skills, specialist ideas in on everything from downloading apps uh, through to drones, it shows the kind of roles that citizen forces can play in a war and the kind of things you need to think about before a war if you want to be ready for it.